you got a blackbird coming up on your deck is a little bit different than if there's a chickadee coming into the, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a different, <laughs> yeah. if there's a robin pecking out your window, that's annoying. It's Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket, and this is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. The topics can wander anywhere, but today's show is, well, topical. Three days from now, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife will kick off a major revision of its Wildlife Action Plan. Sometimes it's hard to remember that we share this planet with other critters. When we don't pay attention, sometimes those critters go extinct. Sometimes it's we people who suffer the impacts. Think Lyme disease. Sometimes we have to manage critter behavior. Sometimes we have to manage our own. If we're going to live in a state that has an abundant diversity of wildlife. Ten years after the first master plan was created, we start talking about a second one this week. Stand by. Today's show is brought to you by Van Raymond Outfitters, Hammond Lumber, O'Neill's Power Equipment, Old Town Trading Post, Dysarts, EBS, and Napa Auto Parts. As today's show starts, I'm in Augusta at the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife in the office of Judy Camuso. And you can kick it off, Judy. So I'm Judy Camuso, and my title is Wildlife Division Director. Okay, and you've been on that job for a fairly short period of time. Yeah, yeah, not just about a year now. So I was acting capacity... In, from June till September, mm-hmm. and then sort of permanently since last September. So. Well, congratulations on the new gig. Thank you. What is a wildlife action plan? Yeah, it's um, other than a, a, I guess the best way to describe it is it's our strategic plan for our. And I'll just use the technical term that we use, and then and then elaborate a little bit for our species of greatest conservation need. So mm-hmm. basically, it's our strategic plan f- for the next ten years for the species, primarily non-game species in the state that are sort of at most risk of becoming rare or more rare. So. Um, People think of the action plan as a way to keep common things common. Mm-hmm. So our goal is we have a, a list of species, and and we s- sort of will use that that list of species of greatest conservation need and determine what sort of actions, what sort of threats those species, you know, are at risk of, and then what sort of actions we can do to help maintain their populations so for we do similar things for bear deer mm-hmm. or moose and we, we have species assessments and management plans this is very similar but for it's a much broader group of species yeah uh, what is the impetus behind it was it something the department decided to do something the legislature said you should do something the fed said you <laughs> yeah. should do or <laughs> yeah it's a requirement so in you know the department's funding cycle Mm -hmm. um we get we get some significant funds from the u.s fish and wildlife service and so to access the state wildlife grant monies which are appropriated by congress um through the u.s fish and wildlife service you have to basically conduct this planning process um to be able to access those funds so Mm -hmm. this allows us to access the funds that we use for most of our non-game species management yeah, it's important for people to realize two things, I suppose, out of that. The first is, no matter what you might think of the federal government, it just doesn't hand out the cash with those strings. No, <laughs> right, no, no. And that's yeah. true government-wide. I mean, yeah. there's this thought that uh, that Congress just dishes out money left yeah. and right that we don't have. In reality, you've got to jump through a whole lot of hoops in order to make yourself eligible for yep. certain yeah. funding sources. And I think the one thing, that you, the way you could sort of look at this is basically sort of like a business plan. And we, we sort of come up with a business plan for the species that we're going to work on. And you, you have to be able to show um, sort of deliverable actions in the, in the end. You have to be able to show that you're accomplishing what you set out mm-hmm. to do. The other important thing I think everybody needs to remember is that uh, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is funded a lot by federal dollars. And then, of course, the sportsmen who contribute through their licenses, there's almost no general fund funding. Right. So uh, to some extent, what the department does is really determined by the needs of uh, the funding source, the federal government in this case. um, And that would be species that aren't game species. And then the game species tend to have their own... Uh, fans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in in all of the federal funding that we get, um, whether it's for game species or non-game species, uh, requires a state match. So you have to be able to match the money to, to access it. So usually it's anywhere between 25 and 35 percent match. Mm-hmm. Um, so for every, you know, federal dollar that we get, we have to be able to 
match it with 25 or 35 cents of, of state money. And that is where this department struggles is because we don't get any general fund. Right. Um, we, we do struggle, particularly with the non-game species coming up with the non-federal match. Mm -hmm. So things like the loom plate and the chickadee checkoff, Maine Ultra Heritage Fund, are usually our best sources for funding the non-game programs. Which is it always struck me as just a little bizarre because uh, that federal money is money we already paid in in taxes. <laughs> Right. In order to get our own money back, right. yeah. <laughs> we'd have to spend yeah. a few bucks of our own state taxation yeah. in order to do it. Yeah. Uh, so, but I think it shows a sort of state commitment that you're not mm -hmm. just sort of, um, you know, that the state's bought into it and you're going to step up and, and support the program as mm -hmm. well. Well, now you've started on a new wildlife action plan. Um, yep. Is there one in place already? There is. It was one that was written in 2005, and it's quite a lengthy document, mm -hmm. uh, like 1,700 pages. Yeah, I know. I opened it's it up massive. this morning and then closed it right away. Yes. <laughs> I'm yeah. not reading this. Yeah. <laughs> it's an enormous document. It's a it's a you know, a really, really thorough, uh, complete assessment of of many of our species of greatest conservation need. Um and so this is what we consider an update, but it's a major update. So mm. we sort of go through all the steps again. Um and that the first step in the process is to review the species of greatest conservation need. And, you know, so there are a few game species on there, but mm. um, by and large, they're mostly non-game. And so we have a uh, species specialist that set out the criteria for those, for that review, and we have a draft. Um, so the first step will be to have the species of greatest conservation need list reviewed uh, by peer reviewers, mm -hmm. so other experts in the field, and also by our conservation partners. So we have a meeting coming up on July 8th where we will present that list to our conservation partners, uh, of which there are about, I think we, right now we have about 63 people coming, so mm -hmm. we're 63 agencies, organizations participating, uh, and they'll have the opportunity to provide feedback on the list and why didn't you think about this, how did you come up with that. Um, yeah. So that's the first step. Somehow I ended up on that emailing list. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so they're casting a pretty wide net if I right. get caught in it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service really wants and encourages broad participation. And from, you know, a lot of our regular partners like Maine Audubon, the mm -hmm. Nature Conservancy, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, um, but also some of our, you know, some folks that are, are new uh, maybe to IFNW and to our planning process. So we have tried to reach a wider range of folks to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to participate. Especially early on. Yes. Because, right. you know, if, you, if there's an issue going to develop, it's nice to catch it and know what it is early. Right. Rather than yes. controversial yeah. after the results yeah. come out. Yeah. 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 Well, we wanted people to actually be involved mm -hmm. and not just review the final document. Right. We yeah. wanted people to have input from the beginning. Coming up, how can you have input? How big is this revision? Where do Maine's game animals fit into all this? If Maine voters decide to change how we manage bears, what does that do to the plan? My guest is Judy Camuso, Wildlife Division Director at the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Welcome back to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. My guest is Judy Camuso, Wildlife Division Director at the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. The state is about to craft its second wildlife action plan. It's a business plan on how to best manage wildlife in the state, making sure we're spending wisely and getting results. The last plan went into effect in 2005, and I assume, Judy, that every plan gets ongoing review more than just once every 10 years. Yeah, we do We do reports every year. So we have to provide the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service mm -hmm. with basically summaries of what we've accomplished the, in, in the past 12 months. We do that every year. So there are sort of um, minor, you know, reviews. And then we certainly revise the job descriptions. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to work on a new species or if we're going to work on a new uh, aspect of, you know, say, shorebird monitoring, yeah. um, then we, we still have to get that approved from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service all along the way. So mm -hmm. those things happen sort of pretty much regularly yeah. throughout the process. What parts of the last plan would be recognizable to the general public? <laughs> what parts? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we do, I think people, of course, probably don't even know we do, but you know, right. we have a whole group of people. And some of the things like the butterfly surveys that you know, mm -hmm. folks have participated in the dragonfly surveys. Those are all part of our state wildlife action plan. Um, and in some of the highlights of things that people probably saw that, you know, in a, some of those things, particularly with the invertebrates, there's just a lack of knowledge. We don't know um, 
all the ins and outs of some of these species. And so um, we embarked on this, these surveys in, involving the public to help us gather that information. Um, so there's been, you know, surveys on owls and yeah. frogs and, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, all kinds of things. Is so, the loon count in there too, or is that a different? Um, I don't, I don't think, think we... I don't think we have yeah. the loon count as mm-hmm. one of our, but. But a lot of the citizen science projects you see in the state that has cooperation of inland fisheries yep. and wildlife is part of this wildlife Absolutely. action plan. Yep, the Great Blue Heron, the Heron Network. And yes. Yep. Just had a show on that recently, yeah, as you might know. Right. Yeah, yeah. Which was yeah. great. Yeah. Um, success stories. You've had some. Uh, what would you point to when you're tell- telling the federal government that, hey, we did this and it worked? Um, yeah, that's a good question, and, and that's one that we sometimes struggle with. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an ongoing struggle yeah, all the time. Yeah, I mean, you got to balance a lot of yeah. things in order to make this work. Yeah. So, you know, one of the projects that we can we look to most recently, I guess, um, would be piping plovers, mm-hmm. and and that's a species that has historically struggled in the states, a state listed species, a federally federally threatened species. Uh, and about five, six years ago, our population plummeted down to about 22 species. I mean, 22 pairs of it's plovers pretty, in yeah. the state, down from a, we had, I think, a high of about 66 um, in the mid 90s. And so we we really stepped up our effort. We mm. we provided some additional um, predator control. We provided some law enforcement on the beaches to help with the management for that particular species. And this year we have 50 nesting pairs, which is the highest in a decade. So yeah. <laughs> it's way too small to breathe a sigh of relief. Right, but, right, right. But I still. Mean, yeah, we'll get into the subject a little bit later on probably in the show, but um, that illustrates one of the conundrums of developing a plan is you've got to balance a lot of things. Yeah. The reason the piping plover is really threatened or endangered is just because it's in a high use area where high people use, like to go. Right, high use area, and then yeah. you know the sea level seems to be yep, making life one. a little bit more difficult for our plovers. Yep, yeah. and anytime we get those bigger storms, which right. we seem to be getting with, yep. dare just, I say, the words climate change, um, it's wiping out more nests. Yeah. This is getting harder and yeah. harder as we go along. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, other success stories you want to point to? Well, um, certainly the bald eagle is a is yeah. is a you know sort of the paramount species Mm -hmm. um and you know as a state listed species it was fully recovered and i think taken off the list in 2009 so that's another real phenomenal Mm -hmm. success story that our department really championed all along the way and with help from our private landowners and cooperators you know we we were down in the 60s to you know 30 or so nesting pairs of bald Mm -hmm. eagles in the state and last year we had close to 635 Mm -hmm. nesting pairs so Really good success stories, and then of course our our sort of beginning with habitat program, which is a program that um, we use as a planning tool to help local towns and municipalities, mm-hmm. you know, understand what wildlife resources they have on on in their town, and um, has been very successful. And I think uh, I'll, t- I'll take it a step further than that. Yeah. It's awesome, yeah, <laughs> because I <laughs> my town, I live in Hudson. My town just revised its uh, comprehensive plan. Yeah. Um, and, and part of that is to identify your natural resources. And the department had really already codified everything for me. Yeah. And I was the one who got to draft that part of the plan. Uh-huh. Nice. So Good. I was Good. on that uh, yeah. Beginning with Habitat website constantly. Yeah, yeah. And I think we've reached out to 175 towns yeah. now, or 175 towns have reached out to us mm-hmm. and asked for help. So mm-hmm. it's, been, it's been very successful. And, you know, it really helps at the local level for people to know what they're, what they're dealing with. Yeah. And it's all voluntary. It's a non-regulatory program. It's mm-hmm. just information. That's um, what it was. It was informational, yep. and it gave me a lot of information. And the best part was that turns out the town of Hudson was already um, protecting most of these resources, ah, that's almost great. by accident. Maybe yep. it was just yep. uh, you know just because of the way zoning codes work, or because of the way shoreland zoning works. Yep. You know, yep. most of what needed to be protected in Hudson already was. Yep. So great. we had an that's easy great. time with that plan, and I give most of the credit to beginning with habitat. <laughs> Good, it worked. Yeah, great. <laughs> All right, how about failures? Failures. failures. Well, huh? <laughs> I don't like uh, to talk about failures. Well, well, let me let me talk about it just to say if you always succeed, you're not trying enough stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there, there must be some things that because of circumstances just didn't work out as way the way that it was hoped. Well, you know, there's lots of things you know, and it, I it's it's hard to you know say it as a failure, but there's there are endless struggles with you know wildlife faces so many obstacles, and mm. you know a number of our you know, birds, for example, as you know, are declining, mm-hmm. you know, and at a pretty rapid rate, rate, um, you know, things like whippoorwill are seemingly kind of dropping off the planet and, mm. um, and nobody's 
really been paying a whole lot of attention. Um, shorebird populations are still, you know, declining, declining at oh, eight, say. 10, 12 percent a year. Um, so I remember what it was like 20 years ago. It's right. Really dropped a lot. Yeah. Line. Yeah. It really has. And yeah. those, those big flocks, you know, of, mm-hmm. of shorebirds, you just don't, you know, where you would see thousands of them, even, mm-hmm. you know, and you just don't really see that anymore. So there's, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunities for, things to get better um Mm. you know i don't i personally think there's no future in pessimism so i can't get too (laughs) hung up on you know Mm -hmm. they're they're you know we we look at some of the or i look at some of the trends um as as motivators to you know kick it up a notch as as much as we can but i can't get too focused on what hasn't worked otherwise i wouldn't you know Mm -hmm. i'd be probably overwhelmed by the doom and gloom of <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> what what could be. <laughs> well, we have an awful lot of effect on the planet. And yeah, the, right. And yeah. Others, other yeah. critters pay, pay the price. Yeah, sure. Judy Camuso is my guest. Or really, I'm her guest. We're in the office of the Wildlife Division Director at the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife in Augusta. That's Judy, and we're talking about the Wildlife Action Plan, which is about to get a major revision. Stakeholders begin work on it on Tuesday. You're listening to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio, 92.9 The Ticket. It's Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio, 92.9 The Ticket. I'm talking with Judy Cabuso, Wildlife Division Director at IFMW, which is about to start working on a new plan to manage wildlife in the state so that we can continue to be good stewards. One of the first jobs will be to come up with a list of species of greatest conservation need which is a different list than the endangered species list, the threatened species list, the list of species of special concern. So the species of greatest conservation need is a list of, uh, you know, of our wildlife. And it's broken down into taxa, so birds and fish and um, mammals, invertebrates, and and then reptiles and amphibians amphibians is the fifth. Um, and there are species that for, uh, and there's a number of sort of threshold that you would m- need to meet to, to be on this list, but either in, and so some of the things when people look at the list are going to seem like they're common, like black throated blue warbler mm-hmm. is on the list. So that's a relatively common bird still in Maine. You, I hear, have them in my backyard, yeah. but the vast majority of those birds breed here in Maine in mm-hmm. the boreal forest or, you know, um, so there's, there's a number of species like that, you know, so, cerule- well, not cerulean, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, bay-breasted warbler mm-hmm. and black pole warbler that all are sort of dependent on a boreal forest. They're still relatively common, but we have what we call the regional responsibility. So basically, Maine is assigned the task of making sure that that bird stays common. So there's a lot of, sp- so a lot of birds in particular are on the list because they we we have the um, responsibility in the region to make sure that their population mm-hmm. stays purple sandpiper is another good example oh, we, perfect yeah because you know i've read that we get like 80 percent of the world's population the, the wintering the population yeah. of of uh, purple sandpipers basically are here in mm-hmm. maine so so there's some birds that might not be showing such a dramatic decline in trend but mm-hmm. we ha- have the regional responsibility so there's there's sort of that criteria then there's a the criteria that the population has dropped quickly and and nobody quite knows why mm-hmm. um so or or rusty we do know birds. why right rusty, rusty blackbirds black another good one mm-hmm. um so there's populations are declining um either you know short term or long term trends are declining you know all mm-hmm. of our bats are obviously on a short pretty short term <laughs> dramatic decline <Yeah>. um <clears throat> so there are, you know, things that are declining, things that are on the edge of their range, perhaps, things that, you know, are just kind of on the periphery of we don't have a ton of habitat here mm-hmm. for them, so they're still relatively rare. There are some, you know, rules around it in that, so a species that moves into Maine, say, like tufted titmouse, mm-hmm. um, it's probably not going to be considered because they, they've expanded their range northward and they haven't been here long enough right. to for us to actually show, a, a dec- you know, a, a trend, so... Mm-hmm. Conservation implies land use restrictions of some kind, sooner or later. <laughs> now, this this list of uh, of greatest conservation need has no regulatory authority. It's nothing that yeah, no, is no, enforced. No, it's just no. it guides the department on what it should be focusing on in order to qualify yep. for the federal support as well. Yep. Yeah. It has. Mm-hmm. There's no regulatory association with it at all, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, it helps us when we're when we're planning, when we're planning short term, long term. What species can we have an impact on, mm-hmm. and what species, you know, is it 
are we not able to you know affect much change and so how are we going to prioritize the limited funds it's a, it's a very limited pool of money right yeah. you know so yeah. for you know right now there's i think there's over 300 species on the list mm -hmm. you know so the department doesn't have the ability to spend a lot of money so we want to make sure that the money that we do spend is is put to good use and um so we have we come up with this this plan to try and help us prioritize uh what projects we're going to take on well, basically, that's just doing the smart thing. There are some yep. species you can affect, some you can't. Yep. Don't yep. spend the money where it's not going to do any yep. good. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we're really hopeful that in this update, a lot of our, our partners will have a tool to help them mm -hmm. when when they're planning or, you know, when, lo you know, regional land trusts or local land trusts are working on projects, that they'll have some additional information that will help guide them mm. um, and to make smart decisions. And when it comes right down to it, IFNW doesn't do land use planning or regulation anyway. You, you're the science people. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yep. DEP does the, the land use regulating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they love that part, I'm sure. Yeah. Right. Um, you have conservation partners. Who are they? Oh, gosh. I mean, a lot of them, but, uh, when yep. you, but it's actually just sort of described as conservation partners in your plan. Right, yeah. So there's, you know, I mean, everybody from, there's um, professors from, you know, University of Maine, USM, University of New England, um, you know, Maine Audubon, Maine, the Nature Conservancy, a lot of the regional land trusts were invited, mm -hmm. Department of Transportation, Maine Medical, um, you know, there's a, is a wide suite of, mm. of people, Ducks Unlimited, Trout Unlimited, the Rough Grouse Society, the Turkey <laughs> Society, Sportsman's Alliance of Maine, the Trappers. You know, there's a lot of people with mm. a vested interest in, you know, our wildlife resources that main professional guides participate. Um, you know, I think we had a list of, and, and of course, the tribes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had close to 75 different organizations that were invited. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the Wildlife Society, there's students that will participate, and um, some of the consultants, um, in sort of the wildlife consultants, mm -hmm. will, will participate. So, it's <laughs> a whole... Here's the can of worms. How about those folks who are proposing the bear referendum? Uh, do they ever come to the? <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, do they, they ever are. come to the table and, and they, try they to get have in? been invited and okay. um and they have accepted to mm -hmm. participate. So we'll be happy to engage with them in a positive mm -hmm. manner and try to work together mm -hmm. for a common good. Well, good uh, habitat and threat classification system. What mm -hmm. do you have that? What is it? <laughs> so that's basically. In, and that's a little bit more complicated, um, but that's basically sort of looking at what what are the different level levels of threats for this species. So the the first thing we'll do is go through and figure out if it's rusty blackbird, if it's you know American red start. What what sort of is the habitat that that animal occupies? Mm -hmm. um, and so the the next step for our biologists will be to go through and take our list once once we have sort of an approved list, and then we'll do. Uh, habitat association for each of those species. Mm -hmm. So everybody gets assigned whether you like, you know, hardwood, spruce fir, you know, wetland, you know, wet meadow, coastal, you mm. know, salt marsh, wh whatever your habitat is. You get so each animal will get assigned um, the, the primary habitat association, and then as a group, um, the the conservation partners in the department will look at what are the threats to those habitats and in particular to those species. So is it, you know, we recently completed a climate change vulnerability assessment mm -hmm. um, in which identified some key areas that were more vulnerable to uh, climate change and sea level rise. And so those areas will get, you know, additional consideration. Um, but, you know, is it, you know, particularly in Southern Maine, is it the threat of development? Is it, you know, are there, you know, roads are a major <laughs> issue? For and we're always Maine. fighting about the sand dunes. Yeah, yeah, yep. <laughs> you, right. You would think we'd have settled that years ago, and we <laughs> thought we did, but yeah, it, it's, yeah. it seems the fight comes back every year. Yeah. Yep. How does the public get involved once you've gotten past this uh, conservation partner stage? Uh, other people may be curious about the result and want to get involved. Yeah, so we are in the process. We have a, a preliminary website up for both the 2005 action plan and then also the update on the 2015 or our web page, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, so that has a lot of the background information for people if they want to review it. And then we will be working, I hope, with the university to come up with some survey questions mm -hmm. so that we can engage the public in some targeted questions that we have for them in you know what the public would like to see with this plan um we haven't sort of 
move through that process yet, but there will be plenty of opportunities for the public to participate and give us feedback both on, you know, the plan to date, what they'd like to see, you mm -hmm. know, where they think we're missing the boat or if we're, you know, on target. So Yeah. And there's conflict coming sooner or later from all of this because there there has to be. <laughs> yeah. in, in order to make informed choices yeah. about what's going to yeah. remain on the planet and what's going to yeah. go extinct, there is going to be conflict about how human activity uh, impinges yeah. on that. Yeah. A uh, perfect example, the black-throated blue warbler we were just talking about moments ago, that needs a certain amount of mature forest. Right. We've got a fairly young forest, and it's getting younger by the day because yep. we're harvesting a lot. Yep. There's going to be conflict there sooner or later if Maine has a responsibility to sustain a world population. Right. Yep. Yep. Now what? <laughs> yeah. Or a three-toed woodpecker. Right. You know, it's the, yeah. like the rarest yeah. woodpecker we yeah. have. Yep. Yeah. Um, there aren't many of them. They're really hard to find. They're in the black spruce forest up north, which has a habit of getting harvested. Right. I've only ever seen one. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, I've seen yeah. a bunch this year. Yeah, I know. I, I read your post. I can tell you exactly where to look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, in the whole, you know, spruce budworm epidemic come, or, you know, the mm -hmm. potential for another outbreak, um, you know, has a lot of us concerned with what's, what's going to happen to the... Yeah. So that's a good question. What happens when something major comes along to change your plans? It could be a natural disaster. It could be a voter decision. Hey, sooner or later you knew the bears would come up again. My guest is Judy Camuso, Wildlife Division Director at the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Work begins in a new wildlife action plan next Tuesday. That is today's subject as Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine continues on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. It's Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. I'm Bob Duchesne, and this is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. My guest is Judy Camuso, Wildlife Division Director at the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. We're in her office in Augusta right now. Work begins in a new wildlife action plan next Tuesday, and just before the break, I was about to ask how sudden changes like natural disasters can affect the plan. Yeah, well, there's, I, I mean, that's the same thing with climate, you know, yeah. you know, how climate change, how quickly is it going to happen? Is it, mm -hmm. you know, and... and that's the struggle we have, um, you know, because this is a 10-year plan. Yeah. Um, it, it's not a 50-year plan, so, but we, we need to start making progress on a lot of those things mm -hmm. in, in the short term. Well, another good example, uh, the three-toed woodpecker we were just joking about. Mm -hmm. uh, you get the spruce budworm epidemic, yep. uh, and if it wipes out a lot yep. of spruce, yep. uh, and we start harvesting all those to salvage them, yep. a whole species is probably going to disappear, disappear. because of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah. there's almost no way to plan for that, but what do you do anyway? Right. Throw up your hands and say, well, it's beyond our control. Uh -huh. No, I hope we don't do that. <laughs> no. yeah. Now, we talked about the fact that uh, really this is for the non-game animals for the most part. It's a few fish that are in some, there's yeah. some mammals that are game mm -hmm. species. But. Yeah. How do, how, do, um, how do you treat game animals differently in terms of uh, oh, this overall management plan? Mm -hmm. So they, the game species get a different source of funding. So mm -hmm. they, they're funded from a different pot of money um, from both the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, from our mm. uh, revenues, you know, and associated with the hunting and, you know, uh, fishing license fees. Um, and so they typically would have a similar process in where we would convene a working group um, well, well, first we would do a species assessment. So mm -hmm. we'll just take, you know, let's just take black bears and, um, we, we would write the species assessment. So our department would be tasked with coming up with where is the population is the population, you know, mm -hmm. in, in different parts of the state, is it increasing, decreasing, you know, about the same, is it on target? Um, is it healthy? All those sorts of, you know, biological questions, how much habitat, mm -hmm. how many black bears can we support in Maine? What's the carrying know? capacity? Right, there? sure. Mm -hmm. So there's the, there's a the biological carrying capacity, and then there's also just the social carrying capacity, which mm -hmm. is typically quite a bit different than the biological carrying capacity. Are we capacity. carrying too many turkeys right now? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So so then once we have a species assessment, then we bring in a, a working group of a wide range of mm -hmm. interests. So, you know, we'll be guides and you know, sportsmen, it would be Audubon, there'd be non game people, there'd be wildlife people that, you know, like to guide just to wildlife mm -hmm. watch wildlife. Um, and then and then we have a series of public hearings as well. So the working group in conjunction with public hearings is where we sort of figure out what in what the 
objectives for that particular species are. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, here in Maine, and not all states do it the same way, but we have um, a public process. So the public actually determines our population goals. Mm-hmm. Um, they're guided by the department, you know, but so we, we sort of sort of guide the process based on the biology with some cyborgs, but the public decides. Wildlife's a public trust, mm-hmm. so owned by the people of the state of Maine. So it's the public that determines with our input um, what they want a population goal for any particular species to be. So for black bears, then the, the public to date is the last working group determined they wanted the you know population at 23,000. So that's you know, a, mm. a balance between a good, healthy population um, with at a socially acceptable level so yeah. that too many people, not too many people are having what we did, would call nuisance complaints or mm. negative associations with that wildlife. So, And yet we have like 30,000 or more. Right, yeah. Right <laughs> now we have a little bit more, probably closer to 37,000, yeah, I think. And yeah. it could get worse. <laughs> yep. Well, we'll talk about that in a yeah, moment. But, yeah. um Returning a little bit to the idea of uh, protecting habitats, you, um, habitats happen on private property. Yes, yeah. Uh, so there's going to be inevitable conflict, I, I guess, if we're really protecting non-game species. Obviously, there's places where everybody can weigh in on this. Uh, you, yeah, yeah. And so it's important to sort of understand that the habitats that we'll associate, that we'll determine now, will be pretty vague. Mm-hmm. And with most of these species, or the vast majority of them, we don't have say site specific locations mm. you know we sort of have a habitat type so people's you know properties aren't aren't going to be targeted or any, right, yeah. anything like that so it would be you know red maple swamp mm-hmm. you know would be an example of a habitat so that that's one of the next steps and we'll make those associations mm. um and then through this process also we have the state has uh, focus areas so those are areas that have a high concentration of these species so high concentration of Mm -hmm. sort of species of greatest conservation need in rare and unusual habitat so and we've developed these focus areas all across the state and similarly they just help guide people their their boundaries are kind of fuzzy you know Mm -hmm. it's it's not the department doesn't actually we haven't done any real land acquisition in a long time (laughs) Um, so we're not we're not out there trying to grab land or anything like that we're just trying to guide guide Mm -hmm. you know people's conservation decisions as they move forward and Mm -hmm. help them understand what you know what our current populations are and and what we need to do to maintain those populations yeah and i think the underlying conundrum is that that there are public values on private land right have a hard time sorting that out yeah and it's not just animals it's not just uh, wildlife uh scenic vistas uh, scenic vistas versus windmills right i mean it's just a classic case yeah Uh, so that's something we're always going to have to sort out. It's always going to be an argument. Yeah. Everyone should just get used to it. Yeah. Well, one of the things, you know, I participated in a like a regional planning committee a couple of years ago, and they did some polling, just, you know, random polling of the public in the area. And, mm. you know, the, the top things that people value consistently are clean water and wildlife and access to Mm -hmm. you know places to walk and and go out in the woods so you know we know from polling over you know around the state and for year after you know for decades people have been telling us that they really value the wildlife resources here in maine so Mm -hmm. um i feel pretty good that the the public supports the department i would agree with you completely i mean it's part of it's really part of our dna yeah we may argue about it all we want about protecting certain critters here and there but the fact is Mainers don't want to be New Jersey. Right. We're proud yeah. <laughs> that we yeah. have all this wildlife yeah. and others don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's who we are, by golly. <laughs> now, let's say you do a, a management plan and then voters decide to ban current methods of uh, managing the bear population. Mm-hmm. What happens to your plan? Well, um, the species management plan for black bear mm-hmm. will... will we won't initiate it until after the referendum in November. So mm-hmm. we'll sort of get our marching orders from the public in November. And, you know, we will do whatever we can with the tools we have available to us. Of course, the department, um, as you know, Bob, is opposed to the referendum. Mm-hmm. And, and basically that because it will completely cripple our ability to manage the population. So we we won't have any tools left in the toolbox uh, to control the population. So still hunting and, mm-hmm. and stalking is is not an effective way to control the bear population in Maine. We're the most forested state in the country. <laughs> I know. Um, and, you know, just to to be able to still hunt black bear in Maine, it's just not realistic. And yeah. um, 
I had some guests on the show, and we argued about whether Maine is like Colorado. And mm-hmm. then in April, I went to Colorado. Yeah. No, we're not. <laughs> no, it's not. No, Colorado's 34% forested. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the reality is Colorado is experiencing tremendous nuisance complaints. Yeah. They had the city of Aspen had mm-hmm. over 1,000% increase in their nuisance complaints in 2012. What, what's happened is that those nuisance complaints have fallen on the towns and in the municipalities. Mm. Um, so the... For example, the city of Aspen's, the, their police department, their number one call for service is bear mm-hmm. nuisance complaints. So that's what the, the local sheriff and police department mm-hmm. are dealing with rather than actually, you know, to some extent, fighting regular crime. That's what's what happened in Colorado is yep. that uh, the, the state just threw up its hands and said, okay, um, we understand you don't want to do this kind of management anymore. Uh, it's now a municipal problem. Right. Call your animal control officer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we don't want that to, you know, we really, I don't want that to be the case here in Maine. Yeah. You know, I, I want, and, and as you know, Bob, I mean, I, I started my career at Maine Audubon, and one of my primary goals was to get people out and to appreciate nature and to get people to, in, you know, to really love wildlife and, and to get outside. And um, and I, I don't, I really don't want people's, primary experience with black bears is to be negative you know mm-hmm. i don't want people to dislike black bears um right. and to i you know right now there's sort of it's a it's a special thing when you see a black bear people are thrilled by it mm-hmm. and i don't want it to become you know oh there's another black bear <laughs> right. in the yard you know <laughs> yeah. do this or do that you know so i don't want it to become a negative association mm-hmm. and i don't want people to start disliking wildlife because you know there is a difference when you have a black bear in your in your backyard you know, mm-hmm. if you got a black bear coming up on your deck, it's a little bit different than if there's a chickadee coming into the, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a different, yeah. there's a robin pecking out your window. That's annoying. Right. Um, but people deal with it. But when there's a black bear on your deck, mm-hmm. that's quite a bit of a different story for people. Yep. One of the things that galvanized me a little bit about this is has nothing to do with human interaction. Mm. Uh, when you have too many predators, the other critters get eaten. Yeah. Uh, the wake up call for me was Oregon. They instituted a spring season mm-hmm. because the bears, they had too many bears. They were eating all the elk and all yeah. the moose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so other populations of game species, other yeah. critters right. were suffering because of uh, inappropriate management or at least not successful management within the state of Oregon. Right. And this referendum would prohibit our ability to ever have a spring season. So we would be very, very limited in our options for controlling a bear population. We wouldn't be able to use the three most effective mm-hmm. methods. You know, bait, dogs, mm-hmm. or traps, um, and we don't have a spring season now. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, you know, that's not anything we've talked about. But we would right. never be able to have one, so mm-hmm. we wouldn't be able to use that to to help control the population. Yeah, I mean, we get compared a lot to the states that uh, back in the early '90s banned some of these practices. Yep. We get compared to them a lot, but it's only a partial comparison. They all have Sunday hunting. All right. On top yeah. of everything else, yeah. we're the most forested, we're yeah. thickest, and we don't hunt one day of the week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, it, it's like we, we'd we have both hands tied behind yeah. our back. They're also all, you know, the in Colorado in particular, their bear system is more similar to our moose system in that it's a lottery. Mm. So they can just increase the number of people that they allow to hunt bears whereas right now anybody that wants to hire, hunt bear in Maine can. Mm-hmm. Um, so we don't have any mechanism really to inflate the number of people. In fact, we've done a, we just did a survey this past year of all the folks that have hunted bears and 78% of the non of the, of the out of state residents said they would not hunt bear in Maine. If mm-hmm. the referendum passes in 60% of our residents said the same thing. So we'd be, we'd be dealing with a pretty limited pool of people. Um, yeah, maybe we have a lot of bears, but you can't see them. <laughs> right. It's re- yep. I mean, still yep. hunting, still stock hunting is, yep. is really difficult in the state. It, it basically is. Basically, it's, yep. it's an accidental ambush while you're out there yeah. shooting deer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. And it, it's, a, it's a possibility on a good food year when mm-hmm. bears stay active later in the season and deer hunters see them. But even still on the best years, you know, only about 7% of our harvest is through still hunting. So yeah. we'd lose about 93% of our ability to manage the population to harvest bear. Boy, I hope somebody puts all this stuff on the radio someday. <laughs> <laughs> the radio station is 92.9 The Ticket. The show is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. Coming up, I'll ask Judy Camuso at I W why I should care about dragonflies.
You are listening to Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine, and I'm in the office of Judy Camuso, Wildlife Division Director at the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. The state is about to begin crafting its second wildlife action plan, which considers conservation of a wide range of species. And right now, Judy is going to tell me why I should even care about a state-endangered dragonfly called the ringed bog haunter. Oh, I mean, it's yeah. a state-endangered species or state-threatened species, I guess. Yep. One or the other. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it is. Why should mm-hmm. I care? Yeah. Why? why? You know, and, that, and that's a good question for any of our sort of less... Um, sexy wildlife yeah, you might say yeah. you know there's this sort of classic megafauna like bald eagles and mm-hmm. people can rally behind a species like that um but you know some of the lesser known species really are ecologically very significant in um they're usually sort of specific to a certain habitat type uh and you know i sort of liken it to if you're you're flying on a plane and you know one or two of the little rivets pop out mm-hmm. probably fine but at one point you know you're no longer going to fly in the plane because so many of the rivets are gone you're not sure the plane's safe and you know so all of our species have value they all have a role to play some of it we understand pre- pretty clearly some of it we don't really understand what what would happen to the system if we lose that bog hunter mm-hmm. you know well, um, furthermore, some of them are like canary in the coal mine. Right. Uh, yep, if you're absolutely. losing them, something else is going wrong. Right. What's what's going on in that system that it can mm-hmm. no longer support that particular species? And I think uh, consistently, Mainers have shown, uh, you know, both through the polls and through surveys, that they they want intact systems. We don't want to only have the common species here. I mean, we don't want mm-hmm. to just have, you know, chickadees and turkeys. You know, we right. want a full <laughs> suite of wildlife. Mm-hmm. And, and people have told us that over and over again. Yeah, the canary in the coal mine thing matters as much, too, for human health. Uh, oh, absolutely. Because, we, yeah. you know, when we were seeing things like the peregrine falcons die off yep. uh, and virtually extinct to the east, uh, yep. it was because of chemicals in the environment yep. that could have impacts on humans, right. too. You see it yep. with mercury uh, when we were having... Um, you know, acid rain. Uh, yeah, all these things yep. were killing off things and telling us. And then it, you, know, it you guys are next. Way back up. <laughs> I know right. it. Yep. You know, when you're at the top of the food chain, you're absorbing all this stuff too. That's right. Uh, yeah. So and long lived. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We bioaccumulate a lot. Right. We do. <laughs> <laughs> Mine tends to be Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> I um I chuckled at the second guessing that goes on whenever the department makes a decision. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to scratch my head about it and wonder why people do it, but it's just second nature to Mainers, I think. So the department makes all these decisions, does all this work, researches all the science, uh, sp- you know, sends its people out to do hard research, and then makes an informed decision on how something should be managed or regulated. Yeah. And immediately my sporting friends, and you know who you are, by the way, <laughs> come out of the word work and say, well, that's got to be wrong. That's wrong, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah. no cure for that. No, 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 no. You know, I mean, I guess I, you know, I appreciate that people have an interest and that they um, want to engage with the department, mm-hmm. and that you know, it's it's fine for us to be questioned, and and you know, we can reiterate our science and sort of re- you know connect that back with people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just be part of the conversation. Yeah, I'd don't, rather have people be part of the conversation than, than don't not. Don't stand on the sideline and throw bricks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sick. So let's yeah. outline the steps again. This is a wildlife action plan. Uh, you're having your very first meeting on July 8th. We do, yes. Uh, and then uh, how long will this process go on? It'll be about a year and a half. Mm. Yeah, the the action plan update is due in December of 2015. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll meet in July, and then we'll probably meet again in September or so. Uh, and then we'll probably break the group down into subcommittees so they can, you know, because there's 60 or 70 people is kind of a lot to manage. Yeah. So we'll break them down into mm-hmm. smaller groups uh, and work on discrete tasks. Um, and and that'll, that'll take about six or eight months to go through that, the mm-hmm. threat the threat portion. Um, and then we'll sort of start drafting the update. And, and the one thing that I, I would like to see, you know, come out of this in, in it, I'm not sure how how we're going to accomplish it, but the last action plan, as you know, Bob, is 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 a massive document, yeah. and it's it's a fantastic guiding document. It's got great great resources in it, but you know it's it's intimidating. And <laughs> it's so big, you, think? you know, it's hard to hard for people to get you know to think they want to kind of read it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd like to have this have components that are usable for you know, a local land trust or, mm-hmm. you know, an Audubon chapter or regional planning commission or local municipality so that you could go in and find a document that's um, 
easy to read, understand, in a, of a size that's not so quite so intimidating. So it, we do yeah. want it to be more accessible to the public than mm-hmm. the last one was. Well, that would be helpful, I think, in that, yes, it serves the department to be able to know where to focus and how to yeah. focus. But if uh, if it's not engaging the rest of the community, then really you're not, right. not uh, accomplishing the full goal. Yeah, yeah. We can accomplish so much more with our partners than we can, you know, I mean, in fact, you know, in reality, all the projects we work on are, are partnerships. But, you know, if we get more people invested in, in the plan and making use of the plan, then, you know, our goal is going to be much easier to reach. Well, Judy, thanks for being on the program. Thanks very much for having me. That's Judy Camuso, Wildlife Division Director at the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. On Tuesday, the department begins the massive undertaking of crafting a comprehensive wildlife action plan. If you want to know how to get involved, well, we covered all that, so you might want to listen to the show again on the web at 929theticket.com. Bob Duchesne's Wild Main is brought to you by Van Raymond Outfitters, Hammond Lumber, O'Neill's Power Equipment, Old Town Trading Post, Dice Arts, EBS, and Napa Auto Parts. Next week, I'm going all the way down to Booth Bay Harbor to visit the Coastal Maine Botanical Garden. It's the largest garden in New England. Join me next Saturday morning at 9 a.m. on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket.